apple orchards are an incredibly powerful tool when it comes to managing white-tailed deer. They can range in size from as few as two or three trees to as many as two or three hundred. It's simply a matter of how much time, effort, and money you're willing to invest in such an endeavor. But I can tell you this much. If you plant an apple tree, deer will find it. Once established, an apple tree will bear fruit for your family and wildlife that won't be measured simply by seasons, but in lifetimes. When cared for properly, they can be the most productive source of food on any given piece of property. Because of that, the first five or six years of a tree's life are the most critical for ensuring that goal of lifetime production is attained. Cutting corners or putting the cart before the horse can and will set you back, sometimes critically, and because most people these days want to see instant results, they strive for apples as soon as possible. In this episode, we'll touch on a few tips to keep your trees out of harm's way and get your new orchard growing in the right direction, skyward, so stay with us. As mentioned earlier, most people want to see apples hanging on their trees the instant they set roots to the soil. Here's Chris again with a few tips for what we like to call fruitless for five. It can be a difficult concept to adopt, but I assure you the benefits in doing so are far more rewarding. Here's something I wanted to point out. Now granted, these trees are two years old before you pick them up from the nursery. We've only had them in the ground for a few weeks and already you can see they're starting to flower. Now some people might think, oh that's great, I'm gonna have apples already. But don't go along that line of thought. Think long term. Don't put the horse before the cart. Do you want an apple this year or do you want an apple tree for the rest of your life? If you let these flowers go, nine times out of ten it will produce an apple. But it's not gonna be able to sustain it, let alone maintain it. By pulling these flowers off though, you won't have any apples. And what that's gonna to allow to happen is all the energy and nutrients are gonna go into tree growth instead of fruit growth. Now that's important for the first couple of years. I mean, granted, if you had four or five apples on this tree, it's not even gonna be able to support it weight-wise, let alone nutrient-wise. So go ahead and be sure that you get rid of all those flowering stems so that you don't have apples the first couple of years, and instead, you're investing in the tree itself. Typically in a blossom cluster, you'll have five or six blossoms, but usually only one or two will actually set, meaning that they get fertilized and that the tree saves the blossom to grow into a full mature fruit. On this one, you can see here we have all the blossoms, and some of these actually were fertilized, but the tree is taking these and they're separating from the tree. They're not going to actually establish into a fruit, except for the king blossom, which is the center blossom, and usually that's the one that will set the fruit lit which this will turn into a full apple within three months from now. This is pristine, so this is a, a July harvest. Here, none of these actually set. And the tree will actually compensate for the branch. And then we'll come through and we'll identify that I'm not gonna let 30 apples on this little branch. I'll take over probably 75% of these off. Because if you leave them all on there, you'll have the tendency that it'll wanna break the branch because they get so big, or not all of them will establish the full size. They'll be tiny little tennis ball size and you won't have high quality fruit.
Well, here's another reason why we decided to go with the eight foot tall deer exclusion fencing around the entire perimeter of our new orchard, as opposed to using these wire cages like we did here with the orchard we established in 2010. When I was out here last night, all these trees were fine. I got out here this afternoon though, and it's a little different story. Now clearly something wanted inside of this cage. The whole thing's pushed in, bent in pretty good. Now whether it was a deer or a bear, that's really besides the point, but something definitely wanted in there. Now if you can see behind me, about two years ago we had a problem with that tree. We were excited. We had this orchard established for a number of years, so we were ready to let some fruit grow. Well, we let the blossoms on the tree go like it is now, and it established you know, four or five apples. Now unfortunately, a bear came along and those apples looked good enough to eat, so down the tree went. We got up here, the tree was bent over, almost snapped in half, the cage was completely mangled, you could smell bear all over. We thought we were going to lose the tree, but she's doing pretty good, she's holding on. So that's one reason why we decided that the entire perimeter fencing was our best option as opposed to these cages. Now the cages do help. They will take some of the deer pressure off, but they won't protect you 100%. So what I'm definitely going to do again this year, like we did in the years past, we're going to pull those blossoms off so that we don't have any apples, and instead we let all that energy go into the tree growth, not fruit growth. For those who still might be on the fence about the whole fruit, let's four or five approach. Let's check in with Uncle Joel to see firsthand why giving your orchard the advantage of focus growth can produce far more superior trees than those allowed to set fruit. This tree was planted last year. We had a casualty. Um, it never made it past the planting stage. And so I got a replacement tree come in. This is uh, Albemarle Pippin. It's a, an older heirloom variety. And so we replanted this tree last year. So this tree has been in the orchard now. This is the second growing season. And you can see the size difference. This is a little bit shorter than I am, about five and a half feet. And as we walk over here, you'll see a tree that's been in the orchard for three years. This was planted when the rest of the trees were planted. Uh, a tree that's been in the orchard now for three years, and it's a close, probably 10 feet tall. So just a good size comparison between a two-year tree and a three-year tree. Keeping apples out of the equation for just a few short years and focusing instead strictly on tree growth can put you ahead of the game in short order. Just like the annual pruning of branches, which is a topic for discussion all in itself, Pulling fruit blossoms may seem counterproductive to your efforts, but it is a sound decision for any new orchard. Thanks guys, great tips! Our next topic focuses on what viewers can do to give their trees a welcome boost in growth each year. Fertilizer is known for increasing the size and production of plants and trees, but too much of a good thing can have detrimental effects. Let's get back to one of our orchards for more details on fertilizing. Today I'm out fertilizing our orchard. The trees have been in the ground now for about two and a half months, and we waited that time just to ensure that the ground settled in around the trees. Now that it's adequately settled, we can come through and we can spread our fertilizer. Now if we would have planted these yesterday and came in today and fertilized, there'd still be those voids, and the nitrogen within the fertilizer could have potentially gotten in next to the roots, injured them or altogether killed the trees. So you want to give it that little bit of time to allow the soil to settle. Now we have a high quality fertilizer here. This is a triple 13 that we're using. And what that means is that for every 100 pounds of fertilizer, there's 13 pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We have a 50 pound bag, so there's seven pounds of each. The remaining portion is fillers and other nutrients. And so we're gonna spread it around the tree at least 12 inches from the trunk. Now the recommendations are 0 0.02 pounds per year of growth. And so what that means is these trees are in their third year of growth. They grew two years of the nursery and now this season that we haven't planted here in our orchard. And so we want to spread 0 0.02 pounds per year times three years is 0 0.06 pounds of actual nitrogen per tree. And so what that equates out to is about maybe a half pound, a little under a half pound per tree. We're just going to sprinkle it here around the tree and a nice even pattern. Let those feeder roots 
pick up that uh, pick up the fertilizer. Now, when it comes to fertilizing your apple trees, you want to be sure to keep that fertilizer away from the trunk of your tree by at least a foot. Basically, you want to follow the drip line. Now, what's the drip line? If you take a look at the scaffolding of your branches, you picture a circle of all the water that would come down off of those branches to the ground. That's your drip line. An apple orchard is a fairly easy habitat management project that can be implemented just about anywhere by anyone. Your first five years are critical though. Developing a strong tree that will support a lifetime of fruit production is your ultimate goal. But you're never really out of the woods, so to speak. We'll close this episode with one thing that is almost always out of our control. Mother Nature and the role she plays in dictating each year's harvest. As incredibly fragrant and beautiful as this tree is, apple trees like this one fight a constant battle here across the northern tier of Pennsylvania. Our bloom period is typically two to three weeks behind the southern part of the state, which also means we have to contend with colder temperatures later into the year as well. Last year, we had a historic bumper crop. Unfortunately though, we typically lose all or a significant portion of our apples every other year. So how does that happen? Well, as is the case this year, it's the middle of May and we've had an unseasonably warm stretch of near 90 degree weather for the last several days. What this has done is it's pushed our trees into full bloom. The problem is they're calling for low temperatures of 30 degrees over the next day or two. Now, an apple tree blossom can withstand an overnight low of about 28 to 29 degrees. If, however, you encounter anything colder than that, or if you suffer through several nights on that teetering point, apple tree blossoms will be unable to pollinate and set fruit. Like we do every year here across the northern tier, our fingers are crossed that these blossoms make it. Hold on, start over. Ah! Action. For those who still might be on the fence about the whole fruit list for five approach, let's check in with Uncle Joe to see firsthand why giving your orchard the advantage cut. You're fine, honey. I for those who still might be on the fence about the whole fruit list for five episodes. Really? <laughs> Let's check in with Uncle Joel to see firsthand why giving your orchard the cut. As was mentioned. No. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now you have the giggles. <laughs> she won't stop. Now <laughs> she has the giggles. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I can get a lot of work done.